initiative. So there's been four sessions in the past um, two days, and this is the last of our sessions. So this one is going to be focused on some hands-on interaction with the cube in a couple different ways. So let me share with you how we're going to do that. Um, just after this, I'm going to give you a brief intro. There's probably a handful of people in the room that may not know what this data cube thing is. So I'm going to keep that pretty short because some of you have already seen it before. But uh, just to be certain that everyone knows what we're doing, I'll, I'll do a brief intro. Then we're going to break up the room and I'll do one of them here probably using this screen. We'll have one over here in the corner and one in the back. We'll kind of move some chairs around and then one at just out in the hallway. So we'll have four separate demos right here. Each of these demos, we each have a laptop. We've got a little dedicated internet, so no one's going to compete for our internet. So we all have four separate internets. I'm going to focus on uh, water detection, <laughs> water quality. And then Andrew over here is going to focus on cloud filters, mosaics. And I have a chart at the end, and then you can say something just prior to that. Um, clustering and uh, urbanization will be Syed. And Otto is right here in front, and he will walk you through some change detection, coastal change as well as land change. So my guess is water, cloud filtering, clustering, and land change, you're bound to be interested in one or several of those. So the thought when we do this is we have 60 plus minutes to do that. Um, feel free to kind of walk around in between them and, and change. You may want to spend five or 10 minutes with one of them and get bored or have additional interest, go on to the next one and just move around to see a few. My thought is that we're more or less uh, experts, I'll, I'll say, is we know how to run the demos that we're doing, but we would really love it if uh, you wanted to try some things out in the demo, even take over the laptop and do some things and ask questions as you go. I'd like it to be more of a hands-on learning experience for you to see how this all works and what kind of products can be created. So with that, let me do this brief intro for those of you that don't know this DataCube thing. So I said I was from the CIOS organization. This committee represents the space agencies and other organizations throughout the world. I think we're at like 50 plus now. This was a meeting we just had last week. And one of the initiatives in this organization is the Open Data Cube Initiative. So these things called data cubes are a, a different way, not, not necessarily different, people do data cubes all the time. This is more of a common framework and structure that CIOS is promoting, a way to take data products that are normally in these uh, typical scene-based environment, pull those pixels out, stack them in such a way in a configurable format that we call a data cube. It's just a easier way to manage the data from a storage perspective as well as to enhance the way that you interact with the data through analysis. So this is uh, the way we do this. Uh, the Australian concept, Australia is the ones that uh, started this whole thing and then we decided within the CIOS organization, let's, let's globalize this. Let's make this more of a common framework so that we can go to any, any country regardless of their level of uh, capacity and hopefully allow this to work all with the intention of promoting satellite data for broader use. Analysis-ready data is the focus of it. So all the data products that you see in these sample cubes that we have to demonstrate have all been prepared and pre-processed to what we call analysis-ready data. So in the case of the Landsat data, you'll see this is all surface reflectance data that has gone through the normal processing scheme. We grab our data from uh, Landsat or from USGS, and, and we accept their processing scheme. Other people, like in the case of Australia, they do their own processing. But in the end, they all end up with surface reflectance. That's pretty much the ARD. Everything is open that you'll see here today. So all four of these demos, if you wanted to run these, uh, I'll show you the, the website you can go to for the Amazon. If you want to interact with the Python notebooks, because two of these sessions are Python notebooks, which is more of a hardcore programming interface, we are willing to give uh, access to that on a short-term basis, but for those of you that are really interested, we can extend that a bit. But we will give you information today at the end of the session on how you can contact us to get a username, password, and get into that system and actually do Python programming on our cubes, test them out, have fun with them, and uh, learn a bit. But we use Amazon, so we're, we get these Amazon credits. So it's wonderful that Amazon gives us these credits. Benefits of cubes, uh, all some of these I've already said about expanding our use of satellite data, the fact 
to data preparation is reduced. Interoperability, we won't show that in any of our data today, although a, a few of the products we have take Landsat 7 and 8 combined interoperably. So you might say, well, well, aren't they the same thing? No, not really. They're not necessarily the same thing. For instance, the water detection algorithm we have for L7 and L8 is a bit different because the bands are a bit different. So the algorithm is slightly modified. But if I'm just detecting water, it's nice if I have a stack of Landsat 7 and Landsat 8, and the code doesn't really care. All it knows is I'm going to query both of those data sets underlying, and I'll, I'll find out if there's water or not water, both data sets. Problems. And that's important to us because it, it really is not going to be a viable product unless there's some support behind it. And we're targeting 20 countries in the next five years. So we've made a lot of progress. There's a website out there now, opendatacube.org. We've, we've named this initiative Open Data Cube, and the open is, is the key to all of this, both through the software, promoting the satellite data, being open. We have a partners group and a steering group that manage the initiative. Um, if you go onto the website, you'll find some white papers, governance plans, ways that you can learn about how, how would I want to deploy this if I do it uh, for myself. We had a workshop at IGARS. We'll do another one next year in Spain. The 2018 IGARS is in Spain. I think those workshops are the day prior to the conference, so it'll probably be on the Sunday prior. And we're, remember I said we're targeting 20 countries in five years, and we're already talking with 32 in some way or another. Some of them have just shown minor interest, other, others more significant. So what I'm gonna do now is, is tell you what will happen in each of these demos. Give uh, these guys the opportunity to talk about the demo they're going to do. And I'll start off uh, with mine here in a moment. But again, just repeating, these are the four demos. So the first one you're going to see, uh, first two of them, are going to concentrate on using this Amazon web interface uh, on this AWS. This is the URL. We can give this to you later, but if you just remember tiny URL, data cube UI, that'll get you there. It's this interface that allows you to interact with the data. The two that we'll be doing, so Cloud Free Mosaics will be done by Andrew, and the water quality and water detection will be uh, by myself. So the two of us are using this user interface to do our demos. The other two are using Python and Python notebooks. So you get to see the underlying code. Underlying what's happening here in the AWS interface is also Python code. It's just you don't see it. So for dummies like me, this is a much better way for me to play and get the data because if I start messing around with Python, they laugh at me because I crash it. And Brian, why did you do that? Well, I don't know. I just thought it would, thought it would help. So here is uh, what I'll do for water detection. I'm going to show you how to create this time series product here, which looks at the time series, every one of these is a pixel, you know, every little dot in here, and if I look at that particular pixel, the percent of time it was water is 20%, but underlying that is a lot of data. Times when there was water, times when there was not water. Using the cube, I can tell you exactly when that little spot here was water 20% of the time. I can tell you if it was seasonal, I can tell you if it was just a rain event that lingered for maybe a year or two, or is there a significant change in the actual body of water? because maybe it was never water for 80% of the time and just the last two years suddenly a part of this, uh, uh, you know, part of this lake broke off or something like that. So anyhow, you can really see some amazing underlying data and I'll show you how to do that. And then the other one I'll show you how to do is water quality. This is actually a, uh, I think it's total suspended matter, max value for a lake in, I think this one might be in Uganda but uh, gives you an idea of the variability of total suspended matter being water quality. So that's that one. Uh, Andrew. Uh, sure. So um, I'll be uh, working on generating some cloud-free cloud mosaics. Um, I think most of the people in the room uh, understand the importance of the cloud-free mosaics. I mean, uh, not only do you need to filter the results so that you can do analysis, but also the impact um, to if, to convey uh, a message to somebody can be greatly increased simply by generating a cloud-free so, mosaic. So uh, we'll run through, and um, we can go through a couple of different areas, generate cloud-free mosaics based on a couple of different mosaicing algorithms. A large majority of these analyses run very rapidly. Just, it's just amazing 
when you think the underlying data, you, you see those, especially like the water ones and the cloud free mosaicing. 15 years worth of data, just in a matter of less than a minute, 10, 20 seconds. It zips through that, creates the product pretty amazingly fast. Now, in the case of PyCCD, that takes a little longer, but he can talk about that. All right, uh, next, Syed. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Syed Rizvi, and I have four of my team members here today. And uh, three of them will be demoing uh, the interactive tutorials. Um, we are very fortunate to be working under the leadership of uh, such a great visionary, Dr. Kilo. In the session that I'll be conducting, I'll be talking about an unsupervised classification, um, specifically the k-means, how you can from scratch write the code uh, to get some uh, classification done. The other one that I'll be talking about, and feel free to um, play around with it, is the urbanization. Uh, we use um, very simple band math to get to know what is uh, the area that is getting urbanized, um, classify them into urban, water, and land. So um, the medium will be, as Brian said, a Jupyter Notebook. It used to be called IPython Notebooks, now it's Jupyter Notebook. Um, once you install that, and you know how to do the Hello Data Cube, in my opinion, it's pretty simple. Uh, there are some things that become complicated as you go in the sophisticated uh, algorithms, but otherwise, for the very basic NDVI, NDWI, urbanization, uh, k-means, it's just a matter of calling a function from a library that you would import. So I look forward to uh, meeting you and uh, working with you. Thank you. The underlying code for many of these algorithms is really not many lines of code. Because it's calling so many other libraries and you don't really need to know, um, you know all the code behind the libraries, it takes a limited amount of code to create some amazing products and it's really fantastic what you can do. So not a significant amount of code knowledge. Now if you were to maybe be the person writing the library, that yeah. might take quite a bit more. But actually using the library and just um, doing the normal MATLAB type functions or, or data analysis functions, really tremendous. All right, next is uh, Otto. My name is Otto. I'm a software developer at AMA. Um, I support Brian Kilo. And my day to day involves implementing modern Earth observation research on the data cube. I'll be talking about change detection specifically. Uh, the world would be a very, very interesting place if nothing changed ever. So. <laughs> We'll be focusing on how coast change specifically, and I'll be showcasing a uh, an area in Vietnam, and we'll be looking at deforestation, urbanization trends, uh, roads being built. Uh, we'll see all of those being detected by this algorithm. We'll now um, split up into these little segments. It's going to take a, a moment for us to kind of rearrange chairs a bit. Take the data um, and pre-process it and ingest it such that you have stacked and aligned it. Mm -hmm. You can take a pixel and do the pixel drilling and a time series analysis. Mm -hmm. You say, okay, what happened to this region in the last 30 years, sure. tell me. Because if you go uh, scene by scene, you can still do it in the traditional scene-based analysis where you say, okay, this is my scene. And so you don't have to ingest in that case. And you see cyclical changes, you say, Crops are grown, and, yeah, yeah. and then all of a sudden there is there is a shift, and then cyclical cycle keeps going. And if you investigate, you find out that there was a drought or so, something happened. Pixel and that pixel changed twice, and those areas here changed one time, and it turned out that those were uh, deforested areas. Pretty high light, and you get some scattering because it's not a perfect. And then I say validating the land change. So the next thing I do, I think it's 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 called buildings. Tends to be very much clear. Those are the elements that are stable, way, but I get good no, results as well. Other things like water, so there is a coherent here. Of course, that's a band. It's a lens that's set in there. Brown, so we have a similar amplitude first acquisition and, yeah, from image to image. This was nice and green, but a few Yeah. Okay. Right. Later on, a later acquisition. Right. And so if you're only looking at the amplitude on a at the level one, allows me to do you by don't get any of that. Right. I can right. and just rerun that one. Right. So I can see what's 128, 127 look like. It'll just keep it right back on the screen. That's good. 
it's doing that the distance might want to cover. I think that pretty spot right on the tip there. I processed it, and the last thing I do is from that one specific I want, show me what the bands look like. Remember, I said the one that changes the most is the square. Square one, and this is where the, the break occurred. So that there was one break. <laughs> okay. One long cycle. This is the so the code thinks through its analysis that the land change right here. But notice, you get a lot of strange, erroneous, you know, outliers. You look at the red band, it's a lot harder to tell than you see this one square. And then that's it. That was the last code block. So this Python notebook is probably the most complex one we have running to change detection by CCD. But it's really nice because. I can run a bunch of cases. I can load in different cubes. I can analyze and so forth. Are we ready? Are we getting hey, That's all right. Any other questions on this? Good.